We're going to talk about succession planning this morning. And more specifically, we're going to talk about our bench strength. How do we develop a good pool of future leaders? Oftentimes, organizations are, are really well prepared to replace their chief executive. And there's a, a whole line of succession in place for that individual. But we tend to forget that when we start to replace upper levels of management, that creates uh, sort of a, a, a waterfall effect, right? Where if we're moving people up through, there are other openings that are created as a result of that. So we're going to look at that middle piece of succession planning. And the beauty of that is the principles that we're going to talk about today can be applied up and down throughout the organization. So there's no difference necessarily in the approach for succession planning based on the level within the organization. But because we're focusing on that mid-tier, that mid-level management uh, bench, we're going to see that there are some pretty neat things that we can do to develop the organization and develop that level of talent for ourselves. So uh, in, for what we're going to talk about today, we're going to look at the business case for succession planning. And some of you are here probably because you think this is an important topic for your organization. Um, so I want to give you some data, some stats to take back with you if you want to begin having these conversations with upper management about why we need to have a plan. So we'll look at that. Uh, we'll look at some signs that I've seen in organizations that show that the plan that they have isn't working or it won't work. Maybe it's on paper and it looks good on paper, but we'll take a look at some signs that say, yeah, maybe that's not going to work if we actually have to implement it. We'll certainly look at planning strategies. Um, it's funny because tough economy means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And depending on the industry uh, that I'm speaking with, they'll say it's a great economy right now or it's a tough economy right now. I'm thinking, well, what's the difference? It's the industry and how it's impacting. So we'll take a look at that. We're going to look at, at the wedding. Uh, we're going to have a wedding today in here between succession planning and leadership development. Oftentimes, these two items are looked at as separate things we have to stay focused on. We're going to see that they actually go hand in hand, and we'll look at how we can plan for that. And then finally, I'm going to send you off with 10 ways you can begin right away, 10 things you can do to get rolling on your succession plan and your leadership development moving forward. So in terms of uh, the numbers, I found this, this study from uh, the Corporate Leadership Council, um, and 72% of them said, that they are going to have a significant number of leadership vacancies in the next three to five years. How many of you would describe that as your organization? Okay, about half of you, more than half. Okay, good. And so at the same time, 76% of the companies that said, yeah, we're going to have these vacancies, said, you know, we're not equipped to handle those vacancies. Now, of, you, of those of you that raised your hand, how many of you are, are there, too? Okay, so th this is good, right? So I had an organization... Um, it was a state housing authority that I had worked with uh, on their succession plan. And we got down to this one department, and it was a five-person department. And they had identified that of the five people in the department, four of them were already retirement age. They, didn't, they hadn't submitted for retirement, hadn't given a date yet, but they were of age. They could go anytime they wanted to. And then as we dug in a little bit further, we said, okay, when these openings happen, and they're going to happen, where exactly are we going to find our talent? And the reality was that this position to hire from the outside world was going to be next to impossible because they'd be competing with private entities and couldn't compete on the basis of salary. So they figured we've got to home grow our own. And we started working on that plan, and we found out that that learning curve was going to be three years. So four of the five people already at retirement age and a three-year learning curve to develop someone into that, that role. Fortunately, they were able to work with those four folks, get them to commit to staying on and mentoring and things. So we worked through that. But that's one of our biggest challenges is we're going to look at that today. What is the learning curve for some of these positions? How exactly can we make sure that what's, what we put on paper from a succession plan will actually work once we go to, to put it in place? And so if we only apply succession planning to that top level, that so-called C-suite, right, the positions that have the C in front of them, we're making a huge mistake. Sometimes they're the easiest to fill. We're looking at that, that next level down and how that might be much more difficult. Okay, so here's a definition we're going to work off today. That succession planning is a process. And more importantly, 
This process is about looking at key positions. So for purposes of our time together, what I'd like you to think about today is get in your mind a position now that you would say is critical to the success of your organization. And keep that position in mind over the next hour and a half. So that you can start to say, okay, as we, we look at some of the, the processes we're, we're going to talk about today, you can start to think about, well, what does that look like for this one position, this one critical position? So think about a position that's critical to your success that's not up at that C-suite level. And keep that in mind as we go along today. And so what I look at is we've got a couple different pieces in this definition, right? We have the intellectual piece, okay, uh, the, the corporate lore, as it were. How does your organization operate? What's the culture there? That's a significant knowledge piece we have to be concerned about. We also have to be concerned about the actual job itself and the knowledge that comes with that job. So there are a number of things when we look at how we have to develop people that we have to think about to get them ready to move forward in an organization. Okay, so we know that there's going to be, and in some cases we are experiencing a scarcity of talent. What is gonna drive that scarcity of talent? Or what is driving it? Any thoughts on that? The millennials. Okay, what about them? It seems like they don't stay one place for very long. Okay, they don't. Generally, you get about three years out of them. Okay, and then they're going to move on. Is that a bad thing? I personally don't think so. Not in the economy that we are in today. We are in a knowledge economy. And the idea that someone's going to come to work for us and stay for 30 years and retire is long gone. Okay? It's, just, it's, it's gone. It's not coming back. So those of you that are sitting here perhaps saying, wait a minute, I've got 25 years with my organization. What do you mean, Ed? It's gone. Okay? You're the last of that breed. And in fact, what we're seeing is that not only will millennials only stay for an average of three years, but that over half of that generation right now is contemplating a complete career change. So think about that, not just a job change, but you know what, I'm fed up with being an accountant, I'm going to go be a therapist, okay? A complete shift. So the whole idea of what we're dealing with with talent is changing right before our eyes. And, and guess what, folks? We talk a lot about the, the millennials. The millennials are entering middle age. Darn near, right? I mean, the youngest millennials, or the, excuse me, the, the eldest millennials were born in 1980, or thereabouts. They're in their mid-30s. I was talking to a good friend of mine who happens to be a millennial, and she says, I'm tired of being called a little kid. I'm in my mid-30s. I've got my house. My husband and I are, are planning to have kids. I'm a big girl, <laughs> right? And it's true. We act like they're still college kids, and they're not. In some cases, they're probably leaders in your organization. What we should be worrying about is Gen Z who's coming up through because we don't know a lot about what they're going to want yet. Okay? So what we need, though, is we need to develop a tool for looking at how do we figure out this scarcity of talent and what it means for us. What is the impact on the scarcity of talent for us? Why don't folks want to come into our industry or our particular organization or this one particular job or department in our organization? Those are the things we're going to address today, okay? Uh, we talked about the knowledge retention, but also one of the softer pieces that we get out of succession planning is when people see that there is a career path for them, or at least that they are being developed along a career path, then we start to get some motivation improvements. We start to get some retention improvements. Believe it or not, uh, probably many of you have heard the old saying that people don't quit their organization, they quit their what? Boss, thank you. They quit their boss, right? And there's some truth to that. The reality today, though, is yes, we still quit our bosses. But we, especially with the millennials, they are all about learning and development opportunities. They are leaving in many cases because they don't feel like we are investing in them. Okay, so we have to add that into the mix. So that's, a, that's another soft uh, side effect that we get out of this. All right? Now, in terms of choosing positions, let's go back to the position that I asked you to think about and see if that position matches up with these items that I have here. Is that position critical to meeting your strategic plan 
or your goal or your competitive advantage. Okay? If not, let's think of another position. Do you ha does, is this position unique to your organization or unique to your industry? If so, that's okay, but that's something we've got. It's a little bit different than hiring a staff accountant. You can find those from probably any industry and you can train them in the nuances of your industry. But are there positions that are unique to you that if we had to go out to the marketplace and find them, it would be very, very difficult, okay? Think about the, the influence in the organization. Think about the learning curves, okay? And then finally, how much of what they need to know is experiential in nature? What is it that, you know, we can't necessarily train them. They just have to be on the job to do it. So when we start to think about our, our positions, the ones that you have in your head, if they hit a lot of the things on this list, they're one that we need to start succession planning for now because it's probably not a position that we're going to be able to just run an ad for and fill quickly. Okay? So what we don't want to think about is succession planning is often thought of as, well, when a position up high is vacant, we move people up through the organization. But we can apply the same methodology that we're going to talk about today laterally as well. So sometimes when we look at development, and this will be a topic we'll explore this morning, we can use people laterally to develop them. So perhaps it's two steps to the right before a step forward, or a step to the left before they go up. And so we'll look at this as a, as a different sort of way of planning for succession in our organizations. Okay, so from a success standpoint, organizations that are good at succession planning ultimately have the ability to, to anticipate openings. So it's not a reactive scenario. It's a situation where they say, you know what, I know so-and-so is looking, and I know that because of X, Y, and Z. They've outgrown their position, and I don't have any more opportunity for them. I know that so-and-so is going to, to plan on retiring in another year or so. We know these things inherently, but sometimes we wait until we get official word from these folks before we actually move. Companies that are good at succession planning anticipate those moves and begin planning accordingly. And then they look at their people strategy. How many, anyone in here from HR in your organizations? Just one. Okay. So what we have to look at is what's our organization strategy? Why do we exist? Why do we do what we do? And then how does our people strategy, how we pay our people, reward our people, um, train our people, everything that involves our employees, how does that match up with our corporate strategy? Do those two sets of goals align? And I like to use a very simple example. Let's say you were all customer service telephone reps. And I said to all of you, you know, our customers are important to us. And so, you know, when you get them on the phone, you get their, their problem resolved for them. Make sure one call resolution. That sounds good, right? Because we would all want that on the other side. But then if, what if how I paid you was this? I'm going to measure you on how many calls you take an hour. Does that make sense? It's a complete disconnect. How often do we do that? How often do our strategies in different parts of our organization not all come together appropriately? And so we'll look at succession planning is one way of developing our people, but it should mesh into our, our organization's corporate strategy, where we're going, how we're getting there, and why we're going there. Okay? So ultimately, when we look at meeting all of these requirements from a succession planning standpoint, what we're really talking about is sustainable business results. We want this to not just be a paper document that helps us sleep better at night because we now know where we're finding our next person. There should be marked business improvements, measurable things to our bottom line that we can say are a direct result of how we've developed our people and how we've planned for succession. That's how we know we've done it well. And again, all of these pieces we're going to look at this morning. So let me ask you this question. How do you think most organizations fill positions? What's the process? Advertise it. Advertise it, right? 
Okay, look in terms, maybe you post it on the company bulletin board, something like that. Are those two ways bad? No, got to do them, right? But what are they in most cases? Reactive. They're reactive, right? We, we're not looking ahead and saying, okay, well, what am I doing ahead of time, okay, to plan for that opening? So I often get calls from organizations that says, Ed, I just got notice from someone. They gave me 30 days. Okay, great. That was generous of them. Uh, can we fill a position in that time? <laughs> right? It's almost impossible to find the right person to go out interview, you know, to first to run the ads, then to do the interviewing, then to process them, then to try and get them on board and expect to have some overlap with that person going out the door. It's just not going to happen. Okay? So we have to think about that in our succession plans as well. How quickly can our succession plan solve that issue? Because part of succession planning is also planning for going to the outside and planning for what that looks like ahead of time. Okay? So best in class organizations we'll talk about in the next slide, but they're very systematic in how they go about filling positions. And we'll look at why that is here in a moment. Okay? But ultimately, successful organizations have succession planning as part of their culture. It's just sort of a natural flow of what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And it comes back to their value of their people and their leadership development piece in everything. So let's look at this systematic approach. Okay? They regularly look at their staffing. So not just in terms of how many openings do we have, but I took a call from a good friend the other day and he said, Ed, I'm really struggling with turnover. How do you measure turnover? And I said, well, okay, that seems like a very easy question, right? But let's, clearly he was, he's a smart guy. Clearly he was digging a little bit deeper or wanted to dig a little bit deeper. And I said, well, how are you measuring it now? And he said, well, we look at it in terms of the first 90 days or six months or first year, and it's anyone going out the door. I said, well, that doesn't really tell you anything. You need to get better data in first. Why are people leaving? How much of your turnover is voluntary, in other words, people quitting, versus people that you're firing? Okay? They're in the healthcare industry, high turnover. Okay? And a lot of it is performance-based. So let's get those pieces out. We want to look at that because maybe there's something wrong with our recruiting structure if we're having to terminate people for poor performance on a regular basis. And then he said, well, my biggest voluntary turnover is between 6 and 12 months. I thought, wow, okay, that's a little later in the cycle than I normally see. So what's going on in that 6 to 12 month window? Well, guess what? It coincides with about the time that his employees have completed their onboarding process and the handholding process. So something is clearly wrong with the onboarding. It's not getting people where they need to be and they're dropping off because they're frustrated. And that was all in the space of about a 15, 20 minute phone call. Okay? But the point is, do we have those kinds of talks? Why are we losing people? Why are we keeping people? Are we keeping people we want to keep? Or are there people we don't want to keep that are still hanging around? And if so, what should we be doing about that, if anything? Okay? But all of these pieces need to run together. From a needs assessment, what does our organization need in terms of talent? What is it that we need today, but where is our organization changing? I guarantee you in two, three, four years, your organization is going to look differently. It probably looks different now than it did five years ago, right? So are we looking ahead and saying, what kind of talent am I going to need four or five years down the road? And how is it going to be different than what I need today? That's an element of planning that we have to think about. Okay? So one of the things that, that we have to do with this proactive approach is this succession planning cannot be driven by one individual in your organization. So if you have an HR function, or you have an HR person anyway, you can't go back and say, hey, I heard this guy at the convention, and here, use this. Let's get this in place. It, it, this is not a one-person show. That's not what succession planning is about. We have to have broad participation. Why do you think that is so critical? Okay, so we want to create buy-in. Absolutely. Why else? Any other thoughts?
Okay. Okay. So we may not know some nuances about every individual, all right? But ultimately, we have to know what people want. And what's the only way we can know what people want? Ask them, Ask them right? How often do we ignore that basic principle? How often do I just say, well, Muriel, she must, she must want to be, uh, she's an HR generalist now. She must want to be HR manager one day. What if she doesn't? What if she's very content at her level? Or better yet, what if she needs to stay at a generalist level because of personal things going on? She's got children she's taking care of and parents she's taking care of, and she can't take that promotion because it involves some travel or longer hours or weird schedules, and she can't do that right now. We need to know those kinds of things because if we just make an assumption that, well, she's great at what she does, and she'd be a great HR manager one day, maybe she would be, but we have to ask her. I've had that discussion with someone uh, in an organization where she was, was really assumed to be the heir apparent to the executive director. And when I sat down to interview her for purposes of the succession plan, she said, Ed, I don't want that position. I said, oh, well, everyone seems to think you'd be good at it. She says, I know, they've told me that, but I don't want it. I said, well, what, what do you want? She had told me flat out, within three years, I will be out of this organization. I like doing what I'm doing, and I want to do it for a larger organization. I don't want to be an executive director. No one had ever asked her. They just looked and said, she's great. She's going to run our organization one day. Only she didn't want to do that. She loved her piece of the pie, just wanted to expand her horizons. Okay? So um, one of the things with succession planning that we'll talk about is keeping it simple but also very transparent. And some organizations, especially based on their culture, struggle with this. They struggle with me telling Muriel, you are going to be our next HR manager. Because what, what could happen with that if I do that? Morale goes down because Jacqueline is also an HR generalist. And she's saying, well, why not me? Why am I not going to be the next HR manager? What do I have to work for around here? That can become a problem. We'll talk about how to resolve that today. What else could be a problem with transparency? It's not a reason to not do it, but what else could be a challenge for us? What could happen to Muriel? Right? The head gets big, and she starts walking around campus like, yep, I'm the next big thing. Okay? What does that tell us, though, if that happens? She's not ready, or she's not the one. So transparency, we have to be careful with it. But I believe those risks, and there are many others, are worth inheriting because people will buy into something that they understand and they can see. If they think the succession plan is all top secret, under lock and key, and we don't know, and am I the next, and what's going on with me, you won't get the buy-in you need from the rank and file. And ultimately what will happen is it'll breed a culture of mistrust. And so I believe with succession planning we have to talk about that. I would rather have the tough talk with Jacqueline and say, here's what we need to do to get you ready. Okay? I'm not just going to tell her, hey, you're not, the, you're not the next one. I'm going to tell her that, but then we're going to talk about why. Now, what might happen when I have that talk with her? There's really only two things that can happen, right? What's one of them? Quit. She might quit. Is that a bad thing? No. Not necessarily. It might be the best thing for us. It might be the best thing for her, mm -hmm. right? The other thing that could happen? Motivated. Motivated and say, I need to learn. Now, granted. Things happen, right? Time comes, we're ready to promote Muriel, and she says, hey, I've got a family, so I can't take this promotion now. Guess what? We didn't give up on her, we developed her. You say, okay, Jacqueline, next person's standing, let's go, you're in. So there are a lot of good things for that. I had a situation in, a, in an accounting firm, not unlike that. There was a senior manager in this firm, and senior manager was the next step before partner. And he was great, he was awesome, he was a tax guy and you went to him for any tax question you had. He knew the tax codes inside and out. But the one thing he couldn't do was develop business. 
Well, if you're going to be a partner in a firm, you've got to be able to bring clients to the table, right? And that just was not his expertise. And so we sat down, talked to him, and, and his name was Jeff. We said, Jeff, look, you're, you're probably not going to make partner unless you step up your business development efforts. He goes, I, I'm just not comfortable doing that. Okay, well, then you just need to understand that I know you want partner, but that's, if you can't develop your own book of business, that's not going to be an option for you. Okay? Now, here's the challenge. That firm only had three people in that role. So Jeff is now a roadblock, is he not, for development of other managers working their way up through. He ultimately left the firm and went to a smaller firm where, he did, where they did make him a partner. So he got his career wish by leaving that firm, but by him leaving it opened up a senior manager position for another rising tax manager to take on their way to partnership. So again, sometimes people leaving are not a, it's not a bad thing for those involved. It's how we handle it that can, can make or break. Because the reality of succession planning is, depending on how frequent our openings are, maybe, maybe Jacqueline, in order to develop, has to leave our organization to go get experience elsewhere. And if we've handled that exit smartly, she may want to come back one day and come right back in higher up on the pecking order because she went off elsewhere and got the skills that she needed. That's really the environment we're in today with the mobility of the workforce. Just because someone leaves us does not mean they're not coming back around another time. Okay, so we've talked about the fact that this is not something that gets delegated. Managers have to own this process. So there has to be a team that's going to work on this. And, and it's best done by a multi-discipline uh, team. So maybe it's someone from HR and the executive director and someone from marketing or, or whatever, right? You have folks who are impacting various pieces of the organization. And so we'll explore that here in, in a moment. But ultimately, there's only so much you can learn at events like this, right? You go off for a couple days, you attend half a dozen or more sessions, you get that big data dump into your brains. And it's tiring, right? I mean, we get overloaded. I know when I go to, to conferences to stay up on, on my learning, I'm worn out because I'm trying to process everything. But then when I come back, I say, okay, well, what am I going to do with all of this information? What, what's going to happen here? Okay, how do I put it into practice? And so that's the big part of succession plan. If we think that we're just going to send someone off, well, well, all Jacqueline needs is to get some HR, uh, some, some HR certification. certification on. Yeah, that's a good one. We'll send her off to get that. Okay, so she checks that box. Well, what does that really mean, right? Does that really mean she's ready? Or can I get her some on-the-job experiences? Okay, that's where we really start to find out if someone's ready. It's not just about knowledge, it's about abilities. Okay? So when we think about being progressive with the assignments, I think about, I give her something small. We start there. I work with her on that small project. She completes it. She does well with it. Maybe that, that small project, if it's something we have to do on a regular basis, it's something that I now give to her and say, you now own this project. Then maybe I challenge her with something bigger, something bigger, something bigger. Okay? And so we want to make sure that we're challenging our people through the development process. And we'll look at a couple different ways here today that we can do that as well. Um, but ultimately, what we have to do, I've seen organizations that do a lot of moving around. Okay? So Mark, I say, Mark, you know, he's, he's going to be the next manager of whatever department. I say, you know what, what he needs is he needs to spend some time over in finance, so we're going to throw him over there. And then, you know what, he needs to be out on the road. He needs to get some sales experience, so we'll do that. And then, you know what, an IT rotation. Let's throw that in there. So he spends three or four years doing these rotations, right? What has he learned? Exactly. We don't know. We know he checked the boxes. Yeah, I spent my year in sales, spent my year in IT, great. But what was he supposed to gain from those experiences? And how did those experiences mold him to make him ready for his next position? Oftentimes we do these little transfers internally. We say, oh, well, go over here in this department for a while and get that experience. But if we don't have a set learning plan for that person and what they're to derive from that experience, 
what difference does it make? What goals should he have hit to demonstrate that he learned something while he was going through that process? So we have to remember that even through the course of the training piece, we want to be holding our folks accountable to what they need to be learning and the skills that they are going to be developing in that process. Okay? And so the only way we do that sometimes is through individualized career planning. Do any of you have that currently? Where you sit down with, with your next level and plan out, just one, plan out. This is what I think I'd like to do and here are the skill sets that I'm going to need to get there. So I can remember uh, being in corporate America and being a, a young HR person and I sat down with our department manager and I said, this is where I would like my career to go. And she said, okay, here are the skill sets I think we need to get you to make this happen. And we developed a plan for that. And I said, okay, well, I think I already have some of these skills. And we talked through that. Yeah, you're right. You have this one, you have this one, you have this one. Okay, the ones I don't have, how am I going to get them? What are my responsibilities and what are your responsibilities for helping me to get them? Because it does have to be a two-way street. Okay? And so that really helped me ultimately to see that if we're going to be successful in developing our people, they have to share the ownership in it. If we simply say, hey, Mark, we're going to throw you around in these, these different assignments, and at the end of it, you'll be ready, and we don't hold him accountable to bring some skills out of those assignments, we've, one, done a disservice to him, but more importantly, done a disservice to the organization because he's filled spots that maybe a more capable person could have been filling for us, but we were willing to take that chance because we were, quote, training him. But if he doesn't have de demonstrable skills coming out of it, then he hasn't been trained. So we have to ultimately individualize the development and individualize the feedback that he's getting along the process. So we call that mentoring, right? Someone has to be along the way checking in with him to make sure he's learning what we need him to be learning, that he's processing what's going on out there. I know for me, from an HR perspective, when I was in-house, I would make it a point to ride along with our sales reps. I wanted to see what they were experiencing out there. What was it like to be out in front of the customer? I had come up through the organization, so I had done a lot of the hourly jobs. I knew what that was like. But I wanted to get the sense for the, the external world, so to speak, because I knew that would help me be a better HR person. So how do we apply that same experiential type, ex type of system to what we can do? And how can we do that? Okay? So, Think about this, 40% of all newly promoted managers fail, and they fail within 18 months. Is that, is that stat surprise anybody? Why not? Why not? Okay. Okay. Other? Someone else not surprised by that, and why? They're not ready. They don't know what they don't know, right? So, you ever heard of the Peter Principle? What's it mean? Yes, you're promoted to the level of your own incompetence, right? And we do that, and here's why we do that. We don't try to do it, but think about it in, in very simple terms. I come to your organization as a widget maker, and I'm the best widget maker you have. You say, well, gosh, Ed's a great widget maker. Let's make him supervisor of the widget makers. Now, is there logic there? No. The skill set it takes to make the widget is very different than what it takes to motivate and supervise the widget makers. Two completely different skill sets, but we do that all the time. We let previous job performance dictate the next job's performance. It doesn't make any sense. Now, I might very well be the next best widget supervisor you're going to have. But if we don't outline the skill set, and develop me into that, that's a problem. I was very fortunate. The organization I was with, um, as I said, I worked as an hourly when I was in college. I came out, took a promotion into management. I was in my job for about a month before they sent me off for three weeks of training to learn everything, quote, everything there was to know about the organization, about being a manager. And then when I came back, there was a game plan for me to work on with my next level to continue that development. Because just because I had been a good hourly person and now I got my, my degree 
didn't necessarily guarantee I was going to be a good management person, right? And so this organization had this figured out. Yes, sir? So this may be beyond the scope of this. No, please. But, um, so how do you reward the great widget maker? Who ah. Is a terrible manager? Who, who may not, do they want to be a manager? Well, mine doesn't necessarily want to be, but they were given the position before I got here. Okay, so when we have a situation where the, is the individual failing right now no, in the new level? No, but they are stressed far beyond where they should be. Okay, so let's call that failing on the personal front, okay, that they're not able to, to process what they're doing. There could be a couple reasons for that. It could be that we've not adequately prepared her from a skill set or we're not giving her the emotional support that she needs. Stress comes from two things, either one, work overload, or two, our lack of confidence in ourselves to get that work accomplished. That's what causes us stress, okay? So have we had a talk with her about why she is stressed, first off? Yes. Okay. The basis of it is she has never learned how to delegate. So I there we go. Okay. So skill set, right? Delegation. That is a skill. If I just say, hey, Mark, here's some work. Go get that done for me. What's that? It's another D word. Dumping. Okay. <laughs> We're dumping work on people. That's not delegating. All right. Delegating is a skill. So that's one where maybe we work with her on how to effectively delegate. Let's pick something that she does that's a really good delegation worthy project. Let's pick the right person to whom that project should be delegated and then let's look at the plan for how she is going to work with that person to delegate that work. So that's one thing that we can do. Now we get that off of her plate, it's going to take her some effort, but her stress level may come down because she recognizes that hey, there's an end in sight now. There's a light in this tunnel. If I can just get through working with Mark to get him the, the, the project in his hands and moving, I can go, whew, okay, what's next? I'm working with a manager right now who, uh, relatively small company, and she has responsibility for HR and finance and office administration. She is a great project manager, as long as it's one project at a time. You give her one project at a time, she is the best person you'd ever want on your team. She cannot juggle projects. And so what ends up happening is this. Oh, I, I can't do that one. I, I got, call me in three weeks. I, I got to focus on this one. Meanwhile, the owners of the company are saying, but, but we need this done. Yeah, but I'm working on this. Yeah, we need that done too. Okay? She doesn't know how to prioritize her work appropriately. And I'm not going to call it multitasking. Multitasking is a fallacy. She needs to know where to focus her time at any given point in time to keep multiple projects moving along. Okay, and so that's a skill set that we have identified that if she doesn't figure it out, what's going to happen to her? Go ahead, say it, Kate. Well, yeah, she's already crashing, but what's going to happen to her? She's going to crash right out the door. We are going to manage her out of the organization. And so I have a call with one of the owners next week about that. Okay, look, we need to have this talk. And what's going to happen if we have to manage her out of the organization? What does that look like? It may be the best thing for this organization because she is holding them back right now because they've got so many initiatives they're trying to get done and they can't get them across the finish line. Okay, but she's been with the company since, it, since its founding. She's been there 33 years. She, you know, you go on and on. And so she is, oh, and I didn't mention, She's a, she is a geologist by training. Okay, does being a geologist and the skill set there have anything to do with being the director of administration for a private entity? No. But somehow she got in there and, you know, that's what happened. But I'm not surprised having a scientific background that when she gets focused on something, she can see it across the finish line, right? Yes, sir. So what about the widget maker who's not interested in 
Ah, so the widget maker who's not interested. They're a great widget maker and uh, they don't want to be supervisor. Nothing wrong with that. I come back to, have we asked them why they stay? What is it about the position that they enjoy? And I want to know why they don't want the promotion because that's important as well. Okay? And so when I do that, as long as I'm comfortable that they are good in their position, and good not just meaning skill set, but good mentally, they're, they're where they want to be, okay, great. Where we can run into challenges is, based on our pay scale, what happens if they get to the max of the pay scale? Then again, we have to have that chat. Look, you're at the max of the pay scale. Until the market moves and we adjust our pay bands, you may not get a raise. Again, the person may be okay with that. They may say, I understand. I get it. But I'm happy doing what I'm doing. So again, I don't ever like to assume anything with my employees. And we could certainly spend a whole nother session talking about employee engagement and how we motivate and retain and, and, and all of those types of things. We could spend a whole day talking about that stuff, right? But ultimately, it all comes back to the same thing. We have to ask them, what is it that's keeping you here? What's keeping you motivated? What's keeping you coming to work every day? Those are, that's critical knowledge to us as business leaders for any position, not just the person who doesn't want the promotion, but for any position. Why do you get out of bed and come here every day with a smile on your face? I want to know that. And you know what? There's a great book, simple read out there. It's called Hug Your People. It's written by a gentleman. I forget the name, his name, but it's called Hug Your People. Written by a gentleman who owns a chain of high-end business clothing stores from Manhattan up and through Connecticut. And the gist of the book is he knows his people to the point that when he goes to a store and he talks to Mark, he knows that, that Mark's oldest son is in band and his youngest daughter is in ballet and he talks to her about that. And he knows that Muriel loves daisies, so she gets daisies when it's her birthday, not roses, because she likes daisies. And so he knows these little things. And it doesn't take much, but that's how he keeps his people motivated. It's those simple little things, okay? But he only knows those things because he's talked to them and he's gotten to know his people. And I look at them like, well, this isn't rocket science. This guy wrote a book and it's not even rocket science, right? But it's a great read and it's a simple read to talk about. Here's a, a business owner who has several hundred employees around various stores, and yet he, he's taken the time to really get to know what his people want and why they come to work for him. That's critical business knowledge. Okay? And so ultimately, what we come back to is, instead of relying solely on coursework and classes, and I've talked to so many business owners, though I'll say, well, you know, your current HR person doesn't seem effective. How did that person get in the role? Oh, well, they were, they were my receptionist, and I sent, her, I sent her off to some HR classes, and she's good now. What? That doesn't make any sense to me. Yes, is there a place for HR classes? Sure, there's a place for that. Just like there's a place for all of you being here today. But the reality is, what am I going to do with the information? Where's the, the, the development? When I was an in-house department manager, and I would send my people off to conferences, they learned the first time. We had our first department meeting. After they came back from the conference, I said, what'd you learn? Oh, well, we went to this session, and this session, this session, I, oh, for an hour, all these sessions they went to. Great, what are we going to do with it? And they sat there and looked at me. And I said, well, wait a minute, you just had three days out of the office at a couple grand a pop, and you went to all these sessions, you got all this great information. What are we going to do with it? Well, I, 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 that's what I got. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. If this is good information and it sounds good, go away and develop a plan for how we're going to do it here. That's, what, that's why you went and got all this learning, right? We want to use it. So when we rely on a curriculum, that's fine, but we've got to relate it back into the real world, into their job, or into their next level assignment to figure out how exactly is this information going to be implemented. Okay? So what we have to do when we look at the organization is we, we come back to culture. Does your organization have a culture that fits what we're talking about? In other words, is there a culture of, I'm willing to work with you? Or is it, nope, this is my area of expertise. I'm not telling nobody nothing, <laughs> right? I had a business owner call me, and he said, you know what keeps me up at night, Ed? My R&D manager. 
The guy's been with me since the beginning. He's smart. He develops the best products for me. Our customers love the, the products we're putting on the market. I said, why does he keep you up at night? He said, because if that guy ever got hit by a bus, my business would fail. I said, okay, that would keep me up at night too. I said, so why do you not have a right-hand person for this guy? I've tried. He won't teach him anything. And he said, now I got this great resume. This kid's coming out of college. And I, I talked to him. He is awesome. I can't afford not to hire this kid. But I'm afraid Joe's not going to work with him. I said, well, we're going to fix that. We're going to get Joe to work with him. He goes, how, how, how? How do you think I got Joe to work with this college kid and teach him how to be an R&D manager? Not rocket science. Okay, it went on his performance appraisal, number one. What are performance appraisals tied to? Pay. Pay. And this guy was getting big chunks of bonuses based on how well his products were doing. And I said, guess what? That piece of your bonus is going down and your ability to develop this guy is going to be a big chunk of your bonus. We put essentially about $20,000 a year on the line if he didn't develop this kid. He did it begrudgingly. He was not happy about it, but he did it. So the, the scenario there is we got him to do what we needed to do, even though he didn't want to do it, okay? But that business, and, and he's now retired, that business would have been in a, in a real bind. There was no hiring someone from the outside when this guy retired and just backfilling the position. They had to have a good four or five years under tutelage. And guess what? The guy continued to get his bonuses because he did what we needed him to do. But he was so afraid that, and why I don't know, because he and the owner had basically started this company together. But he had it in his head that, oh, if I teach someone else my job, I will become obsolete. If you have that culture, then we have to address that first. Right? That's a cultural issue. And that's the biggest challenge with succession planning. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So, then we have to look at the learning curve. And is there someone in-house that has the potential and the interest in that position? And if so, now we work it as a delegation type thing. We give them a little bit of time outside perhaps of their normal function to say, you're going to work with Steve on this project. Okay, and you're going to get a little bit of, so we're borrowing them, borrowing some of their time. That's the best way to do it when we've got tight budgets, okay, where we don't have, yeah, exactly, that situation where we can bring this, this young college kid in and say, hey, we're going to suck up this salary for a couple of years, right? So when we look at that, we just have to get a little bit more deliberate with the delegation and the projects we have them working on to get them to where they need to be. And we might have to recognize that, you know what, by the time that person leaves, they'll be 80% ready, not the whole way. Okay, what are we doing after the person leaves to get them the next 20% across the finish line? So, again, we can only work with what we have, but we have to have a plan to work with what we have. Okay. Um, so, when we look at succession planning, like everything else we want to achieve in our organizations, it always starts at the top, right? So, the executives have to take a look and say, what about people development is important to us? This should be something that is on every executive management meeting's agenda. What are we doing with our people? Because I guarantee you can't name me an industry that does not rely on people. Even when you start talking about computers, well, they've got to be programmed by somebody. They've got to be turned on by somebody. You know, people are the lifeblood of what we do. And we often say, well, human resources are our number one asset. And yet we rarely talk about it at the executive level. Most organizations, all things people, represent at least 30% of the operating budget. At least. I just was with an organization the other day that said, oh my gosh, Ed, that all, if you lump everything in people related to our budget, 80% of their budget are things related to people. That's the highest I've ever heard. I went, whoa. But after we looked at their numbers, it made sense to me. But I looked at that and we started talking about this. How often do you talk about people-related issues? And they looked at me like, well, you know, every now and then. Wait a minute. 
You're only talking about 80% of your budget every now and then? That doesn't make any kind of sense to me. So our executive team has to be willing to look at succession planning and say, okay, what are we doing from a people development standpoint? How are we getting our people ready for their next level of responsibility? How are we making them better in their jobs today? That has to be a fundamental discussion that we're having on a regular basis. So when I think about transparency, I think about open dialogue. So I remember an industry, a good friend of mine was same level as me, and he earned a promotion. Now, the, the job that he was promoted into, I was not interested in. I was happy for him. But the department manager called me in, and she said, Ed, how are you feeling about Bill's promotion? I said, I'm okay, why? She says, well, I, I know that you're looking for a promotion, and you're ready, you're clearly ready for a promotion. We felt he was better for that one. I said, okay. No offense, but I didn't want that job anyway. <laughs> you know, it involved second shift, it involved a lot of things I didn't want any parts of, right? That was okay with me, but it was the dialogue. She wanted to make sure that I wasn't sour grapes, right? That I wasn't walking away and going, why'd he get it? I didn't get it, I don't know what's going on, okay? That was critical. I respected her for taking the time to have that chat with me and to check in and to make sure that I was doing okay. And she said, you know what, I was fully prepared to talk to you about why we felt Bill was better than you for this particular job. I said, no, I see it. He's got some skills that we need in that job, and I'm not sure I have those skills. Now, maybe I'm a little more savvy than the average person. I don't know. But th the point is, she took the time to have the discussion, okay? And it was huge. It meant a lot to me. So think about, when we think about transparency, sometimes we fall back on that, that side of, well, bad things will happen if we start telling people why we're doing things. I'm not a believer in that. I believe that if you have people that start doing bad things because you're open with them about it, you probably have the wrong people. That's probably part of the problem, okay? Now, it's easier, it's easier to say fix that than it is to do it. I get that. But that, that's my belief, and that's why I believe in in open communication. In my firm, my partner and I, we have regular meetings with our employees. We talk to them about the financials of the firm. We have them help us make decisions. We want to be inclusive because we recognize that sometimes we can get the blinders on and we want to make sure that we're not doing that. We regularly ask them, are we meeting your needs as an employee, as a person? Are you getting the kind of assignments you want to work on? If not, what can we do about that? Where do you want to grow? One of our employees right now, awesome at what she does. Best employee I think we've ever hired. She wants to keep doing what she's doing. She has never want to supervise lower level people. Okay, good. And we've talked to her about what's going to keep you motivated. What she loves more than anything else is the flexibility to work on projects when she wants to work on them. Occasionally, I'll get emails from her at 10 o'clock at night. And when she first started doing it, I said, what are you doing? I don't want you working at 10 o'clock at night. She said, no, Ed, my kids are in bed. This is my time. OK, as long as I'm not overworking you, and that's why you're emailing me at 10. But she would rather sleep in in the morning or get her kids off onto the bus or whatever, and then work later into the evening. If she starts having to supervise people, some of that flexibility goes away. And she's willing right now, at this point in her life, being a single mom, to trade a promotion for the flexibility. That's what's key for her. Because she felt open enough to talk to us about that. Good. I'm an open-minded guy. Question? Okay. So we talked about the, the Peter principle, right? Certainly, we don't want to do the opposite. If Mark's not doing his job now, do I really want to prep him for next level responsibility? No. He's got to demonstrate he can do his own job right now. But we have to remember that just because he's a superstar at this job does not mean he's going to be ready for the next level unless I plan out the training program for him. So Peter Principle does not work the opposite way. If they're not good in their current job, we have to make sure we get that buttoned up first. So ultimately, what that involves, I believe, is a, a, a culture of coaching, that we have to have not just managers, but other people who are willing to step in and work with others. So we said about the widget maker who maybe doesn't want the promotion, but he's a great widget maker. Okay, 
maybe one of the things that we can ask him to do is help train other widget makers. I mean, who better to learn from than the guy who's the best at it, right? We call that peer level training. That's, you know, that might be against your culture, but I think it's one of the best ways to train. Because as a manager, sometimes if we haven't been on that job in a long time, we may forget what it's like day in and day out. So and I have one of our great employees do it. And I'm willing to bet if this guy's as good a widget maker as we think he is, he would say, I would love to teach someone else what I know. Now, we have to make sure he knows how to train someone, how to, to transfer those skills, so there might be some development there for him. But ultimately, what a great way to instill a coaching environment. I worked with a shift in an organization that in its district was bottom three in terms of safety. And this was a very manual material handling sort of an environment. And the average age in there was probably 20, 21 years old. Okay? So you have this mentality of, and it was mostly guys, we can throw these boxes around and we can do this and we're invincible. right? Yeah, well, the injury showed you're not. And so what we started out with was, yes, we worked with the safety committee, but it really became about, hey, it's not just management's job to go around looking for safe work habits. And it's not just the safety committee that should go around looking at safe work habits. We put some incentives in place that made it clear that it was everyone's job to go look at safe work habits. And it got to the point where it was not uncommon to be walking around on the floor and see one employee saying, hey, don't lift that box that way. You're going to hurt your back. They started to care about one another. That is a coaching culture. We may not think about that in, in terms of coaching, but that was a coaching culture. We took them in about nine to 10 months from bottom three to number one in their district in terms of their safety rates. It was like a switch flipped. Now, it didn't flip overnight. I mean, it took us nine months, which is still pretty quick, actually. But it was all about getting the people focused on something that we wanted them to stay focused on. And everyone was on the same page, and everyone was willing to pitch in and help. So let's look at some signs that maybe what you have in place may not be working. So no show of hands here if you've got some of these symptoms. Just think about them, okay? So first, are you failing to meet your business objectives or targets? Are there key performance indicators that measure the success of your organization that you are not hitting right now? If so, that likely means you have a situation where your people aren't performing, which comes back to training and development. And we can't succession plan unless we have our people trained and developed properly. Second one, are you finding it hard to find really good talent? Or when you find it, to keep it? Okay? That could be an indicator that there is something going on with your learning and development systems. Right? Um, how about talent management? Again, if we go back, if I sat in on your executive committee meetings, what's being talked about? Is talent management slash people even being talked about on a routine basis? And what is being talked about? I am one of the minority, or in the minority, that say that HR is not a cost center. Most people say HR is a cost center. That's just where we, you know, that's, that function does nothing to contribute to the bottom line. Well, wait a minute. If we control at least 30% of the budget and we do it well, we darn well can be a profit center. Okay? It's all in how we pose those questions. So if HR in your organization is, well, are we in compliance? Do we have the right posters hung up? Yeah. Okay, well, we can train a monkey to hang posters. That's not HR, right? HR is about thinking about talent management. Where are we finding good people? How are we holding on to those good people? How are we training the people that we have? How do we drive the corporate results? That's how you start to show that HR is no longer a cost center. You know, if sales is not a cost center because they bring in money, if HR can drive money by hiring the right salespeople, well, then we're not a cost center either, right? We've hired the right salespeople. So what's being talked about at your top levels with regard to talent management and people? What do those discussions look like? Okay, how about employee satisfaction and morale? Again, if you, do you have a sense for it or do you know what it is because you've done some employee opinion surveys? I got called in to do some focus groups with an organization who all of a sudden saw a monster dip 
in the, the ratings on their employee reviews, or their employee opinion survey, excuse me. And so started doing some focus groups, and they kept talking about communication as a problem. And I didn't understand, because they, they had all kinds, they had a community, or the, excuse me, a company newsletter, they had bulletin boards in the cafeteria, they had town hall meetings with the plant manager, like they're, they're, maybe they're communicating too much. Well, one of the biggest problems is they talked revenue a lot. Okay, nothing wrong with that. This is a manufacturing facility, going to talk revenue. Problem was it was German owned, and when they talked revenue, they talked in terms of euros. Now, I don't know about you guys, I don't know what the exchange rate is today. I don't know what any of that means. Everything that was on the bulletin boards was in euros. Come on, really? We couldn't push a convert button in Excel to change that up? So when we look at that, employee morale was down because they kept, it was a communication break. That's, it was as simple as that. We got that fixed and people started to say, okay, now I get what we're doing. I get why I've got to work this way to increase revenue and now we're talking in terms of dollars. I know what that means now. So do you know what's going on in, with your employees? If they're happy, why are they happy? We don't want to just sit back and go, whew, good thing our people are happy. We better find out why they're happy because we can keep doing what we're doing, right? The flip side is if they're not, why not? Can we get that out of them? Can we find out what's missing in our organization? I bet, I'm willing to bet that some of it comes back to career development opportunities and the learning environment, or lack thereof. Okay, if you have problems recruiting people in, it could be a problem with your employment brand. What is the outside world's view of what you have to offer? There's a website called glassdoor.com. You ever heard of it? Get out there and take a look. Type in your organization's name. See what's being said out there. Usually it's not good. I mean, that's the nature of all things on the internet, right? But people go out there, former employees say, oh, yeah, this place stunk because blah, blah, blah. Very rarely will you say, yeah, I left. The place was awesome, but I left because of this. You'll see it every now and then. But do it. Find out. Because sometimes there's more truth there than if you do an exit interview and the person doesn't really want to tell you why they've left. So find out why you're struggling to recruit employees. Is it because of your pay structure? Yes, sir. Or, ma'am, sir, I'm sorry, I can't see for the light. Glassdoor.com. Yes. Um, and so the other side of recruiting people, maybe it's your pay structure or your benefit structure. You say, whoa, Ed, whoa, time out. I can't do anything about that. We're on a tight budget. Okay, I get that. I get that. So then I step back and say, all right, what is my total budget for all things people? salaries, benefits, the whole ball of wax. What does that look like? And am I using those dollars smartly? What do my people want? Do they want our benefit package more than pay? Do they want pay more than benefits? Do they want benefits we're not offering? And why aren't we offering them then? But if we don't know those bits of information, then we need to ask our people what they want. I had a client that was spending $40,000 a year on their company picnic. Now this was a large organization, but that's a big chunk of money. 30% of the people went to it. Does that sound like a smart use of your resources? $40,000 to impact 30% of your people. Didn't make any sense. I said, why are you guys doing that? What do you think they said? We've always had a company picnic, Ed. That's the golden cow. You don't touch the company picnic. I said, come on guys, $40,000? Your people are telling you, 30% or 70% of them, are telling you they don't want it. They don't value it. So why are you allotting that money? Meanwhile, same organization gave every employee a $10 gift card to go to a bake shop down the street to get their own birthday cake. Now, mind you, you could go to that bake shop. You could have that cake done any way you wanted it any flavor combinations, you could even have it decorated any way you want. And if you decide you didn't want it for your birthday, you want it for your anniversary, your kids, get that done too. Ten bucks an employee, cost them $9,000 a year, and 98% of them got redeemed. Hello? What are your people telling you they value? Cake, right? <laughs> Feed them! Feed your people, right? But think about that. Think about why we spend what we spend, okay? And are our people even using it? Well, we have to have a prescription plan because that's part of it. Well, what if nobody in your, in your office is using prescriptions? You're all perfectly healthy. Do we need to have a prescription plan? I don't know, right? 
Now that, that's probably a little far-fetched, but you know, are there crazy things that you can do for your people that maybe don't even cost you any money? There are a lot of organizations, you think about millennials, okay? Millennials value some of the oddball things. And I was just reading an article the other day, it talked about to a certain extent because millennials live very active lives. You know, they work but they want to play hard too. That there are organizations that employ lots of millennials that are starting to, as part of their benefit package, include a concierge service. So uh, they can make their dinner reservations, uh, handle their dry cleaning, and kind of all that sort of stuff. Doesn't usually cost the employer a whole lot to offer those kind of things. And yet, it's something that is huge value for, the, for their employees. So again, ask your people what they want. Maybe you're spending money in areas of your pay and benefits packages that they don't really want. And that comes back to motivation, okay? Okay, so I think that involves retaining employees as well. We talked about the employment brand. So ultimately, we know that this sort of leadership crisis is here. It's not something we're looking at. I can think about 10 years ago, we were so worried that all the baby boomers were just going to exit at once. There'd be this huge sucking motion. We would hear it, and we'd all be left in the vacuum because the baby boomers were gone. Well, that never really happened. And part of that was, was the Great Recession it slowed that down. But the reality is, Gen Y is every bit as big as the baby boomer generation. And so now that they've hit, we don't have a shortage of people. We have a shortage of talent. Because when the boomers leave, they're taking a lot of knowledge with them. And with the churn that we see in the millennials, that knowledge, while we got the, the talent pool, the knowledge is missing. So what we're talking about today is how, how are we bridging that gap? How are we planning for that gap bridge? Okay? So three strategies to look at. First of all, let's talk about growing your own. That's what most people think about when they think about succession planning. How do I grow my own people? Nothing wrong with that. Okay? So you can certainly look at a fast track where I know in a year I need to fill this position and here are the things this person needs to do. So I'm going to get Kara moving and Kara, this is your job for the next 12 months. We're going to have you do this and then this and then this and then you're going to assume the role. Okay, that's fast track. That's moving it. Okay? And maybe that'll work if Kara's been with us for a while, she's well-rounded and understands the organization. That can possibly work. Otherwise, perhaps we need a little bit better leverage in there. We need to have a situation where it's a little bit more planned out and if we know that Kara has some career aspirations with our organization and we know what they are and we can match those up with a future need, we can be much more methodical about it. But growing your own is certainly one of the more common ways to address succession planning issues. However, then we have to look at what are we investing in her? Okay, so the gentleman back there said, well, what happens if we can't afford to hire someone in to just be the shadow for a couple of years? Okay, well, now we have to start looking at return on investment. So what is it that we can afford to do, and what does the, what's the payback on that? Again, I believe everything that we do with our people has a return on investment. No different than buying a new machine or a new computer or whatever, right? There's always a return on investment that finance wants to run, and we can figure that out as well. And so what we need to look at is, if I want to invest in her, what am I gaining out of it? Is there a risk that I invest in Kara and she leaves with all that knowledge? Mm -hmm. Is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Potentially. I am a big believer that you invest in your people. Okay? If she leaves, that's okay. Yes, that's an investment walking out the door. But is that better than her staying and not knowing what the heck she's doing? I got into a debate with a small business owner. He said, I don't believe in training. You train people when they leave, and I'm just not doing it anymore. And I said, okay, so you're going to have a whole bunch of people sticking around in your organization that have no idea what they're doing. That makes a whole lot of business sense to me. I kind of got it in his face. And he looked at me and says, oh. And I love, Richard Branson has a quote. He says, train your people so that they can leave, but treat them so they want to stay. So it's a, it's a double-sided piece. Now to the gentleman's question, how do I feel about a two-way street of we're going to invest in you, however you need to stay? I'm all for it. Now here's the thing, if, if we want that situation to stick, if I don't, 
if I say to Kara, I'm going to invest in you over the next two years, but after you get this position, you need to guarantee you're going to stay with me for two years. In order for that to hold up in terms of uh, contract enforceability, there has to be some gain to her. So in other words, let's say part of her, is, uh, her development is, I'm going to send you to X conferences and a college class and whatever. There's money out there that I've spent on that. Let's just say it's $5,000. What I can do is say, all right, Kara, if you don't follow through on your piece, you owe us X portion of that. So she has skin in the game to stay. What I don't like is just saying, Kara, if you get this promotion, I'm going to train you up, get you ready for it. And if you don't stay for two years, well, um, that's a problem. No, I think there has to be skin in the game on both sides. All right? Now, I'm not an attorney. So in terms of contract enforceability, where I'm just investing time in her, I don't know that we can guarantee, I mean, we, we, we got rid of indentured servitude a long time ago, right? So we have to be very careful about that. Um, in most states, and I know you guys are, are, are from a number of different states, correct? So every state has its regulations on right to work and employment at will and, and whatnot. So here in Pennsylvania, we are an employment at will state, which means that she can quit anytime she wants to and I can fire her anytime she wants to absent some other form of contract upon which we've both agreed. But, again, in the state of Pennsylvania, there, there would have to be a benefit to her to enter into that agreement. I can't just say, oh, well, here, um, you're going to sign this, and this is going to be a legal document. I have to say, hey, you're getting a raise, and as part of that raise, here's part of, this is the give and take. So there are some legal nuances to that. But in most cases, say year one or sure. year two, then you're prorated of what you have to pay back. Yes. And, and what, what are you seeing that they're paying back? I think it varies. Okay. Because um, I've worked at two higher end institutions. And okay. One, one organization, you know, they were investing in people to go back to get their masters or PhDs and things like that because they were sure. losing, they were trying to hold on to retain talent. But mm -hmm. in doing so, what they were asking, you commit so many years. If you leave, that's your choice. Yes. But we're asking that you pay or give some of that money back. Yes, and I have seen that, and I'm okay with that, especially in a situation where we're asking someone to go get an education and we're paying for that education as part of that. I think that's more than fair. Like within public housing, the agency that I took over, um, it was a revolving door okay. of talent you know, coming in, getting their certifications, but leaving, going elsewhere to double their pay. Mm -hmm. And so there's a question, one, how much you're paying, but at the same time, you're making that investment for these individuals, and then they're just... And then they're leaving, yeah. So I think anytime we have a tangible investment, we're going to pay for this certification, we're going to pay for this college course, this degree, then yes, if you leave, you are going to reimburse us at a prorated amount for every year you didn't stay or something along those lines. Now, it has to be reasonable. You can't say, well, you got to stay for 10 years. And, no, we're talking two, three, perhaps. But I'm 100% I'm okay with it. Again, we talked earlier about skin in the game for the employee. That's skin in the game for the employee. And then you, you return some of your investment if, in fact, the employee leaves. Yeah. So, um, obviously, senior management support, I mean, that's with anything that, that we need to talk about uh, in, in business. Senior management has to be, be on board with this and, and knowing the impact of the money that we're spending. So we're going to sell them on why we need to invest in care and what that return on investment is going to be. The third piece in all this is, is learning a key performance driver in our organization. And if it's not, where is it? Okay, what's the process we have for learning and development in our organization? How much of it is organizational driven, where we're telling our people what they need to do, versus how much of it is the employee saying, I need this skill set. Hey, boss, can I go to this session, take this webinar, because this is a skill set that I think would benefit the organization. It does need to be both sided. Employees do have to own some level of responsibility for their own development. It's not all our, on our organizations. Okay? And so I think that, that if we celebrate people's contributions, 
you will start to see an elevation in everyone's performance. And oftentimes people know who the big performers are. And yes, you are going to have some sour grapes from time to time. Absolutely you're going to have that. But for the most part, you will have people celebrating the fact that Kara just got her certification. Yay! You know, and it's a big party. Why not celebrate that? Because now she can contribute more to the organization. We have to be willing to do that. However, with everything else related to employee relations, if we do it for her, we better do it for everybody else. Because if Mark doesn't get his cake and his celebration, now we got a problem, right? And I've seen that. And it's a shame when that happens. I've seen organizations, hey, you know, we really, uh, we really value education. Go get your master's degrees. And then there's celebrations when people get their master's degrees. And then there's the one person forgotten. Problem, OK? as with anything else. So we just got to make sure that we've got a process even for recognition. Okay, so let's talk about bringing succession planning and learning and development together now. This is where the rubber really hits the road. Okay, so when we look at the leaders that we need to run our organizations, they have to be well-rounded. They have to understand our business. What makes our organization tick? How do we generate revenue? How do we deliver our services? What are the, the measures of our organization's success? And how, do we know what it takes to impact those measures? Everyone in the organization at a management level should have those answers. They should know. I, I go in and I ask mid-level managers all the time, say in private industry, what's your profit margin? I don't know. What's your gross sales? I don't know. Well, what do, what do you do? Well, I, I, I know we make 5,000 widgets a day. OK. Uh, what else do you know? And that's all that guy knows because he's the widget supervisor. Well, we're doing the company a disservice if he doesn't see how making 5,000 widgets a day corresponds into customer satisfaction and corresponds to dollars in the bottom line and net profits and everything else. Our people, if they're going to buy into our organization's mission, what we're all about, they have to understand those key performance indicators. Okay. So ultimately, succession planning needs to be in pencil, not pen, especially if we're going to be transparent. Because if good old Mural's head starts getting big, get the eraser out. Whoops, made a mistake there, right? She's not ready emotionally for this. So it's OK to be transparent, but they've got to be flexible. Again, she may tell me she's ready now, and she wants it now. And then when the time comes, some personal situation has come up that she, is not, she doesn't want it. My wife is living proof of this. She has been offered a promotion numerous times with her organization. She keeps turning it down because she knows that a promotion is going to increase her hours and increase her time on the road. We have a nine-year-old. She doesn't want to be on the road any more than she is. She's willing to trade that off for right now and take a promotion at a later date and time because she wants to come to the ball games with us and, and do all of those things. Okay? So people make decisions based on, and earlier in her career, she, and even before we were married, she moved around. She moved four times for the company all over the place. She was willing to do it. She was single. Why not? Now she said, hey, leave me alone for a little bit. I want to raise my family. I want some stability uh, in my life. So people's needs change, and we need to recognize that. Okay, so learning, uh, leadership development is not training. Training is something like this, right? We come and we get some knowledge. Leadership development is about using that knowledge for the benefit of the organization. All right, so we have to make a distinction there. There has to be the accountability in showing behaviors on the back end when we're developing these people. So what we really want to do is take it from that one-off education event, hey, go to this conference, and we want to say, go to the conference, but come back and implement some things. I told you my experience was, uh, you know, I came up as an hourly, went off for a month, I came back. My manager said to me, I was in operations at the time, my manager said to me, how was the training? I said, oh, it was great, I learned this, and da-da-da-da. He says, great, forget all that, you're back in the real world now. I'm like, wait a minute. You guys just sent me away for three weeks. I only got to see my family on the weekends. Learned a whole lot of really cool stuff about this organization and processes and procedures. And you're telling me, eh, forget it all. Talk about demoralizing. Because it was, it was a great three weeks 
of information download. I was psyched. It's a shame, okay? So we've got to pair it up. We've got to go from classroom to how are you going to use this in the real world? What are the pieces that translate? Okay? The biggest thing with adults is we learn by doing. We don't learn by coming to events like this. Okay? We learn by, okay, I got this information. Now what am I going to come back and do with it? That's how we learn at this stage of, of our lives. Okay? And so we've got to pair that up to drive that home. We've talked about job rotation. We've talked about um, changing up assignments and delegating projects today. Um, one of the things one of my clients did is they would, they would pull together what they identify as their high potential employees. Young college grads coming out of MBA programs and things, and they would put them in a, in a room together, and over the course of a year, they would be freed up for a certain amount of hours to work together to solve a legitimate company problem. And they always, and this is different every year, different group, always came out with an answer that the executive management team never thought of. So you got, you know, they brought in all this smart young talent, put them to use. And it wasn't, again, this was a pressing matter. There was an executive uh, mentor assigned to the group to make sure that the meetings were conducted, you know, in a proper way and facilitated. But they devoted time to get these kids up and running on a, something that mattered to the business, a pressing issue. So when we have a situation where we can't necessarily have a shadow, what, and the person's high potential, let's put them together with some of our other high potentials. One, we start to see how our high potentials work together because they're our future leadership, okay? But also, we can get some really good work product out of it because they're focused on that. For, for those hours that we give them, they're focused just on that piece, okay? So, one of the things, one of the hardest things to do, though, is to get people out of their own silo. So yes, we need to develop them within their job and, and their career path, but how can we expose them to the key pieces of other functions within our organization to make sure that they can start to see the decisions they make in their function have an impact and what that impact is on other pieces of the pie. We know that to be successful, no business, no entity can possibly operate in silos. And so we already know the younger generations love collaborative work efforts. They love it. And it comes from online gaming because they're, they're used to logging online and they don't go kill the enemy one at a time. That 10 of them log in and they work together remotely to figure this out. So let's apply that same sort of gaming technology to the workplace. Let's get them out of their silos working together with different skill sets, again, to solve a problem of value to our organization. Okay? The younger generations love that. And you know what? That doesn't cost us anything but their time in the workday. Okay? And, rem and remember, if you start to do something like this, yes, they still must get their work done. Okay? This is not a, oh, we're going to relax some of your work standards. Maybe you will. But in general, hey, you're a high performer. I'm not going to give you any extra work, but you're going to work on this project over here to help develop you. But you still got to meet your regular daily goals. Okay? Um, what else? Group development. So when we're working with, a, if we do this high potential group, then we see that they start to develop as a group. Well, guess what? If they're our future leaders and they're already learning to work together, what does that mean for our organization as they move up through the ranks together? There's already, the silos are gone. They already have built those relationships. Again, the younger generations are so much better at this than we are in many cases. They don't, they don't necessarily see silos. They see a collaborator who brings something different to the table than them to help them meet an objective. And again, a lot of it, as silly as it sounds, comes from the gaming world. That's how they, they achieved greatness in their online games and things growing up. So they're applying that same mentality, although they don't necessarily know, but they're applying that same mentality to the workplace. They start to recognize, hey, you can bring something I don't have. I want you on my team, and that's okay. What a refreshing bit of, of um, culture that is in many cases. Okay. So all with that culture clash though. When you have folks like that and you have a managerial kind of level that is very intense. Yeah. So I get I get very frustrated when I, I'm working with an organization or giving a talk like this, and right away someone's like, ah, millennials, blah, 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 millennials. You know what? When we really look at the generations, 
There is more that we have in common than we have in difference. And so sometimes it's an education piece. So I think about uh, my first experience with that. So when I was on my college internship, you know, I'm a 20 year old punk and I'm in this manufacturing facility and the plant manager was quote, an old guy, <laughs> okay? And he resented me to no end. And I was studying industrial safety and so I was on some projects. And he just, I, I, I like to think I'm a nice guy and he just would not work with me. And so one time uh, I, I needed something from him and I said, what, what, what's, I, I feel resistance here. I'm not sure why. Well, you're going to come here. You're going to tell me how to do what I do. I said, I don't even know. I don't know what you do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm here to work on some projects to help your employees be, be safer. But I also want to learn, how does this plant work? What makes it tick? What, what's happening here? It was a tool manufacturer. How, how do you make a wrench? I want to see this. How does it go from the design room to the molds to out the door? I want to understand this about business. And that's all it took for him to understand that I wasn't some punk going to come in and change how he did what he was going to do. And after that, then I won't say we were best pals and went out drinking, but there was much more of a cordial relationship. So I think some of it is about communication. And if, and again, I come back to if we have someone who's a stick in the mud like that, then we, start need, to, we need to start holding them accountable to working with others. Um, or, again, absent being some kind of uh, union environment where you've got union rules to deal with, I, I think then there's, there has to be a talk of you either have to do this or, or you're, you're, you're going to be left behind. That's the short answer. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it. Okay, I know we're, we're, we're getting up against the, the end here, and um, I've got a couple more things I want to share with you, but it's been, it's been good to stop and talk about some of these things. So ultimately, if we're, we have a group working together, and they can start to have some feedback from their mentor, great. Then that mentor goes back, talks to their immediate supervisor, and says, here's how so-and-so is developing. Here's some of the things you need to work on with them. Okay? So, your top 10 ideas, I'm going to go through them really quickly. And by the way, I did give Naro my slides, so I, I'm hoping there's a download place for you guys to, to pull these down so you'll have all this information. But think about the tra knowledge transfer you need from top down. What needs to be filtered through versus what can be learned, all right? Think about the relationships across generations. There it is. How do we foster that, okay? There are a number of different things, again, we could spend all day talking about it, that we can do to foster movement between the generations, discussions between the generations, and most of it comes down to instead of, yeah, we can poke fun at each other for the things that are different, but there's so much more that we have in common. And if we can focus on that, that education piece will be much better for it. Okay, how about leadership peer relations? In other words, <coughs> excuse me, can we get rid of the silos at the leadership level? If they exist, our employees are going to mirror that. So we have to talk with our leadership teams to say, hey, you guys got to work together too. Employees have to see that you can work together. Otherwise, they're going to assume that that's part of the culture that stays intact that I don't ever go to accounting for anything or I don't talk to IT or whatever. I stay right here. That, then that becomes a problem. Okay, develop your succession plans now in terms of what do people need to learn, what do they know, need to know. Um, look at your high potentials. Who are they? Identify your high potential employees. It's okay to sit down with someone and say, we value you as a high potential. What are your career aspirations? Have those discussions with them. It's okay. Think about how you can get cross-departmental exposure. That will also break your silos down if you have them. And again, the young people in your workforce are, are super open to this. They won't look at it as, oh, I got to go over there. They're probably itching to go over there and figure out what's going on. Okay. Um, if you don't have the in-house expertise, this is not a personal plug. I am not an executive coach. There are good executive coaches out there. Maybe you need to bring someone in from the outside. If you have a stubborn manager who won't work with the younger generation, okay, fine, we'll go around you. And do we have some money that we can allot to bring in an executive coach? Or maybe you call your local SCORE chapter and get some services for free, right? Um, but look at bringing that, that mentor in from the outside, perhaps, to coach some of your employees if you're just at a standstill with a senior level person, okay? Um, 
Think about involving your leaders in succession planning. Again, this cannot be a one-person show. It can't be a one, one department show. It has to be cross-functional. Once the person attains their new, new position that you've trained them for, it's not a wipe our hands, oh, great, okay? We don't want them being part of the statistics of 18 months and fail. So what mentoring do they need for the first 6, 12 months or so in that new role? We need to plan for that as well. You know, we set the table up for them. They attain the goal. But well, let's make sure we hold their hand for a little bit longer to make sure that it's a smooth ride for both parties. And finally, look at your talent. What do you have in place now? Where do you have gaps now in terms of what you need skill set within the organization to achieve your goals. That's one of the best places to start from a succession standpoint. Okay? So, um, here are some questions that I think you can use uh, when you go back to your organization. If you say this is important to me, take these questions. Again, you'll be getting these slides. Take these questions to your next department meeting. They're great, or, or your next executive meeting or whatever, they're great questions to ask to get the discussion going and to get the thoughts moving, okay? So um, you can go wider and deeper. You can automate this process. If you come from a large organization, there are some great software packages out there that you can automate where people are at in their learning and development. Again, I'm not a software guy. I just see lots of cool stuff out there. I would never try to develop a succession plan if I was in a large organization and not have it automated in some way, shape, or form to monitor people's progress through it, okay? Um, and so think about other things you're doing to manage your people. Succession plan is just one more cog in that wheel. They all fit together, okay? Again, this should not be a standalone. Nothing we do from an HR standpoint is a standalone. They all mesh together. So I also give you a, a nice little chart here that I like to use uh, that shows the colors mean different time points in time as far as vacancies go. Um, I identify whether it's a future, whether it's an immediate. Here's an in-house candidate. Oh, here we filled this one. It worked. It's just one of the things that I use in a smaller organization. It's easier to just kind of put it on an Excel spreadsheet and do some charting out with it. Um, so you have that. I mean, it's just, again, people have asked me, well, how do you track stuff? And this is just a visual. I'm a visual guy. So um, final thought. Think about your work-life concerns. All the stuff we talked about today is all wonderful. It's great for your organization. Just don't forget about all the individuals on that chart and their work-life concerns about any given point in their development. So just because they said yes today, two years go by, that yes might turn into a no. So stay in the communication loop. So I know we're right up against it. Um, I think we got in right under the wire. So uh, by all means, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking time to give me some feedback on, on the sheets there as well and tell me how I did today. Um, but I will hang out if you have other questions uh, that you'd like to, to chat about. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.